You know, if we look at the valuation of resources, in particular prospective resources, we can see that in this case, I'm showing the simple diagram that says there's a 10% chance I could find this oil and gas. If I found it, the volume is going to be between 20 and 350, and there's my P90, P50, P10. The approach we use for this is to, is to do the, a DCF analysis of the successful outcomes and then to combine it with the risk. And the expression at the top is called the expected monetary value, which is just looking at the MPV of success times the chance of it happening, minus the cost of failure. Well, if, if I found nothing, what have I lost? In this case, the ex cost of an expiration well times the chance of failure. The reason I put a question mark here is that most textbooks, most people say, well, what NPV am I going to use in this expression? I've got a range of volumes, so I've got a range of NPVs. A lot of people try to, to shortcut it by just using one NPV. They'll pick the NPV for the midpoint or the NPV of the mean and hope that somehow that that will be good enough to give them the expected monetary value. The expected monetary value is actually the mean of, a, of the distribution of value as opposed to the distribution of volumes. So what we would recommend and what we always do is to look at that volume as it changes. And all I've got here is, these, is a probability distribution now where the axis along the bottom is my probability. But instead of barrels on the other axis, I've actually replaced it with MPV of the field. So what I've done is I've just gone along that curve, everywhere from the 20 million barrels all the way up to 400, and valued every single point on that curve and calculated the equivalent MPV for every outcome. And you can see on this chart how the MPV increases from zero. And that point where it went to zero is, is the 60 million barrel case. So it increases rapidly from there and goes, goes up and up. Below that 80 percentile, where the volume is less than 60 million barrels, as I say, well, we wouldn't develop the field because the MPV is minus hundreds of millions of dollars. So I put in there effectively the cost of failure. This is for an exploration venture. So if I don't go ahead to develop it, then effectively the value is not zero to me. The value is actually equal to what I've spent at that point, which is the cost of a dry well. If you now look at that distribution, take the mean of that distribution. For those of you who know about cumulative distributions, the mean of any distribution is just the area under the cumulative probability curve. But if you calculate the mean, which is a weighted average out of the value there, the mean of that becomes what's called an expected net present value. So theoretically, that's the value of the NPV that should be used in that EMV, that expected monetary value calculation. Okay? So if you do go back to that expression, so what you do now is that you're, you, you're now replacing, you're putting values in there against the volumes. When we get down to the P90 and the P10, well, they're less than the commercial threshold, so we wouldn't develop them. So I'm replacing those with minus 20 rather than than a larger negative number. The expected net present value of the success case, in other words, if you found it, came from the previous chart, and that's 317. If you combine that with the cost of failure, then effectively you get what's called an expected monetary value of 14. Now, a lot of people say, well, what's the, what does that, what does the EMV mean? Because in a single prospect case like this, well, we say there's two outcomes. You either find the on gas fuel or you don't. If you find it, then you're going to be, you could be into hundreds of millions of dollars, or if you don't find it, you, you've lost 20. 14 doesn't appear in that evaluation at all. So 14 just represents the balance between the probability of success times what you gain if you are successful, less the chance of failure times what you would effectively cost you if you did fail. So the first thing we use EMVs for is look at the balance between that gain versus that loss. So an EMV must always be positive. So it's positive, it tells us that that's a, that's a good thing. We would ordinarily never drill an expression well if the EMV was negative, because that's telling us that that's not a good bet to take. Okay? But 14 doesn't really represent the true value of that single, because as I say, it's, 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 it's either a success or a failure. It's either a big number or it's minus 20. But the economic theory would tell me if I repeated this bet over and over again, and always bet no more than $14 million on it, in the long run I would come out on top. 
So oil companies tend to try and follow this, this approach to only ever effectively value the expiration venture at 14. Okay? I say single prospects, single fields, that's quite simple to, to analyze, but most companies were dealing with multiple prospects. That's where the complication lies. And I remember if, if you were here last time, I spent quite a bit of time talking about aggregation of volumes, in particular the volumes in expiration, especially when risk is involved. This is where we find a lot of people actually make quite a big mis error in, in the aggregation. So if we look at this mythical prospect portfolio, so we've got say 10 prospects on the books. So that's a good thing. The more prospects we've got, that's generally a good thing. The numbers in there represent what's called the young risk and the risk means. So that's, I'm, just, I'm not showing you the full range of volumes, I'm just giving you the mean values. So each one of them by default, you can see them must have a 10% chance of success. So let's, for simplicity, we've got 10 identical drilling targets. If we aggregate these properly, along the lines I described last time I was here, then the unrisked, or the expectation given success, is 56 to 128 to 282, that's the P90, P50, P10, with a mean of 153. The key number there, in this big case, because I've assumed that these were independent, is that the chance of making one discovery, at least one discovery, with this 10-well program is 65%. Okay, so that means the chance of finding at least one oil and gas field. We could find two, we could find three, we could even be really, really lucky. We could find four, five, six, seven, eight, even ten. The chance of finding ten, of course, is incredibly small. Okay? The chance of finding ten in this particular case would be 10% to the power of ten. So it's, it's probably almost too small for me to write on the screen. So that's what we expect to find. Now, there's a lot of people who think, well, if some of companies reported the aggregated total. Can I not just use the total and somehow quickly go from the total volume to, to get to a total value without having to go through the rigmarole of valuing every single prospect and doing it the long way? Well, first of all, some companies would say, well, I've, let's look at them all individually, standalone. So I've done the proper evaluation of each one and I've calculated my expected monetary value of each as 14 isn't the risk value of the entire portfolio just 10 times 14, 140? That could be right, but only under special circumstances. And let me tell you when I think that might be applicable. That only works if you assume that all the prospects are drilled, okay? So you only get a value of 140 if you drill all 10. So that, that definitely implies that even if you had nine dry holes in a row, you will drill the 10th well. You won't get 140 if you, if you stop halfway through, okay? And in reality, of course, do companies really go to the, drill nine dry holes and have the stomach for the tenth? Occasionally they do, but not that often, okay? There are many examples of companies that have stopped early, given the acreage away, someone's come in, relicensed it, and they found the discovery on the next well. Equally well, I was involved many years ago in Algeria, where we had a nine well commitment. We'd, we had drilled eight dry holes. And there was a debate, should we, should we just drill the ninth one? Should we just give up? And someone said, well, we've come this far, let's drill the ninth. We might as well. We drilled the ninth well and found 350 million barrels, and it was probably the biggest discovery in Algeria for, for the last decade. So sometimes you can be lucky. Theoretically, it can still work. Just summing up those individual values, <clears throat> also it doesn't take account, much account of the order of drilling. It doesn't matter in that example because they're all identical. But generally speaking, we're going to drill them out maybe either in size order or in risk order. So that can affect, especially if you then quit on the drilling after a certain point, you may quit when you drill all the big ones because what you're left behind to be successful might be all the small sort of sub-commercial volumes. That approach treats everything as standalone. It won't really take into account much technical dependency. So if you've discovered one oil and gas field, what does that do to the chances of finding oil and gas in the, in the next field, in the next prospect? Equally well, if you drilled a dry hole in the first well, what effect does that have on the chance of drilling a well on this, you know, a successful well on the second one? So a dependency does exist. That method would just ignore the dependency. Perhaps even more important, doing them all standalone doesn't take any account of any development dependency or any synergies. 
if they were quite close together, maybe you could tie some of the fields back. So the incremental value of some of the discoveries could be much higher because you've already got a producing field in the area. And then if you're dealing with PSCs, then because the ring fence for the calculations may well be the entire license area, then the, the value of, of a barrel changes with, with, with the more barrels you find. So the first 100 bar million barrels could be more valuable than the second 100 or the third 100 because the state take is going up with the more barrels you discover. So there's a lot of reasons why the, simply adding the standalone values will give you a very pessimistic answer. Another favoured approach, which one, again, I, I don't particularly favour, is, is, is what's called success case scenarios. So let's accept the volumetric summary that's been done for us by our, our geoscientists and have used their probabilistic tools to get to that point. And this is usually from the engineers driven. They'll say, well, let's, let's just do a, a representative case that represents, say, 128 million barrels. The first thing the engineer says to me, well, show me where it looks like, where it is on the map. Because I can't, I can't engineer it if, I don't, if you don't show me where it is. I said, well, I can't show you where it is because that's just a statistical answer. It could be anywhere in that portfolio. It could be in one field, it could be spread over two or over three. Every one of those answers is a valid answer. It all come to 128 million barrels. But every one of those outcomes would produce a slightly different NPV. Okay? So it would be rather nice if 128 million barrels was all in the one field. That would be a very good result. If it was spread out over lots of fields, it could all be sub-commercial, in which case the value could be almost zero. Still 128 million barrels. And I can't differentiate in the statistical analysis where those barrels are going to come from. If I put on other parameters like water depth, and say we've got water depth contours going from 200 meters down to 800 meters, where would you like to find your oil now? It would be really nice if I could find the oil in prospect A as opposed to prospect I and J. The MPV of those fields is much, much higher because the costs are going to be much less. If I put on what I call development clusters, if all the discoveries were in a nice cluster, again, I could develop those in an integrated fashion and the incremental value of the fields would be much higher. The worst outcome would be to have a bit of oil in cluster A, a bit of oil in cluster 2, and a bit of bit of um, oil in, in Prospect H, because they're all virtually standalone with no synergy whatsoever. So you can see that there are thousands of, in fact, there are literally thousands of permutations and, and combinations of success and failure in a portfolio of this size, every one of which will lead to a different NPV. It's not unique at all. There is no unique solution. There's nothing in there that says, show me the mean of 153, where does that occur? It doesn't occur anywhere. It could, it could, I could draw it anywhere in there and be, and be valid. So in cases like that, we feel that the only way forward, and it's, it's time consuming, is to effectively value every single possible permutation combination of that portfolio. Every combination of success and failure in all the fields produces now a chart that looks like this. This is very similar to what I do with the volumes, only this is now saying the probability of occurrence, the cumulative probability on, on the, the y-axis, against the range of value. And you can see on that axis, you can see that there's a commercial chance of success of 60%. If you remember back to one of the previous slides, the chance of success was at 65% on just the volumes. Why has that changed? Well, to say some of these success cases, the oil was distributed in an uneconomic way. And therefore, that never got developed. So the chances of commercial success has actually gone down from 65 to 60 in this little example. There's the range of NPV. The NPV of this drilling program could be as low as minus 200. What's that? Well, that's 10 dry holes. That occurs 40% of the time. It could be $22 million. It could be as high as 691. It could even be up to $2 billion. What this chart tells me, the chance of of getting to billion dollars of value is extremely low. It's, it's fractions of a percent. It could happen, but the P90, P50, P10, which is the meaningful range, is minus 200 to plus 691. The mean of that distribution, as I say, is, is 140, which represents the true expected monetary value. The equation is just a shortcut. The real way of getting it is to actually do it fully probabilistically and get the mean. 
Now, in this case, because I made absolutely everything independent, even though I said independence is fairly unlikely, the mean, of course, is 140, which is the same as 10 times 14. All right? So if everything was, really was independent, then you could add up the numbers. But if you assume some form of dependence, and all I've done is, is put in a little bit of dependence between the chance of success and in, in terms of the success NPV, then I've changed the numbers quite dramatically. The chance of success I'm showing now as commercial success is now 50%. So that's the impact of putting in the dependency, because there's a lot more outcomes now because of the dependency that are falling below the commercial threshold. The P50 is, is, still, is now two, minus 200. But the mean of the distribution has gone up, because when it works, it can work, the numbers are more positive. So then the mean is dragged up to 175. Now, we tend to produce these type of charts. It seems odd that we spend all our effort describing uncertainties, uncertainties in the volumes, uncertainties in costs, uncertainties in prices. And at the end of the day, someone comes along and tells you the EV equals X, a single number. Well, why is it a single number? Everything's been arranged so far. So we tend to produce these. Yes, we do quote the mean, the single number, which is what a lot of people try to get to, but we also quote the range. So that the reader can see just how big or how small that number could be. The mean is just an expression of that um, distribution of values. So that's how it ought to be done. As I say, lots of people take shortcuts to try and save time. Sometimes there is no other way of doing it but to do it properly. To, do, to take a shortcut on a complicated portfolio, the numbers could, might as well be meaningless. I don't, wouldn't trust them at all. So let's say the commercial success is, is there 